Have you ever had the, the experience, the, the pleasure of getting to see a professional public speaker? You know, maybe one of those TED Talks presenters or, or one of the people that goes from conference to conference, <clears throat> or maybe a presidential candidate. You know, they, they've got their stump speech. They're the kind of people who, who come out and they speak and they know what they're going to say, they know how to say it, and they do it with passion, conviction, and clarity. You know, they're, they're the people that when they come out onto the stage, before they get out there, you know, they have all the, the accolades and the titles. They're a doctor of this. They've, they've been awarded this certificate. They've written this book. They've presented here. You know, it goes on and on and on. It's impressive, no doubt. You know, it's very impressive when you, when you see these people. But you know what I find more impressive? Is when you hear the, the everyday, average, ordinary, regular Joe or Jane speak. Speak, tell their story with, with passion and conviction. And, and it might be a little rough around the edges. You know, they're, they might be a little nervous. They might talk a little fast, almost as fast as I do when I preach. You know, they might, they might talk quickly. But, you know, they've, they've just got some sort of authenticity that, that comes out in their message. I've had the, the privilege of, of having that experience that, that just shaped me a few times. And, and one of them was when I was down in Guatemala, I met a man named Carlos. And he was an, an uneducated man. He, he just had lived a full life. And he, when we opened the scriptures, he was able to open the passage and speak of God's grace with more passion, with more conviction, in a, a more convincing way than most pastors, professors, or seminarians I've ever met can. Because his life had been the story of scripture. He had experienced that truth. And, and you know, the last few weeks, I've had the privilege of, of listening to the confirmation students give their faith projects. You know, you can't help but be amazed. Where did, where did these young people get such faith, such conviction, such passion? Even if, even if they were quite nervous at times or, or struggling to get through it, you could, you could hear it in their voices. But, you know, they, they just could speak it. And, and you wonder, where do they get it? But we know. You see, the Holy Spirit came on them at baptism and has been guiding their life and, and shaping those events so that they, they would grow in faith and, and it would give them the words to speak. Sometimes those words come out a little bit better than other times, but it's the Holy Spirit guiding that message. See, as we go into Acts chapter 4 today, we hear another story. We see the, the religious leaders are confused. They're, they're befuddled as Peter and John are preaching and they're teaching the people and every time Peter opens his mouth more and more people come to believe in the resurrected Christ and then last week we heard the story of of a man who was born lame and Peter and John heal him through the power of Christ and he begins leaping up and down and he's dancing you know he's doing a little shuffle maybe the, maybe the Super Bowl shuffle I don't know I don't know what dance he was doing but the, the religious leaders see it and they demand that Peter and John come in and tell them by whose name and by what power are they doing this we want an explanation, and we want it now. What gives you the right? What they got, I'm pretty sure they didn't expect. Because Peter responds with a hard-hitting five-verse law and gospel sermon. I know, I'm sorry, my, my sermons are never five verses long. I apologize. I'm going to try and work on that one. <laughs> but, you know, in, in verse 8 to 10, paraphrasing, he, he essentially says, you want to know by what name and by what power this has happened? I'll tell you, it's, it's by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you murdered, whom you killed, you crucified, you handed over to the Roman people to, to be killed. And that was God's son. That was the Messiah, the author of life, and you killed him. Whew. That's, that's pretty hard-hitting law right there. And then he comes back in, in verse 11 and 12 with the gospel. But God raised him back to life. And in him, God offers forgiveness. God offers mercy even, and, and grace even to people like you and me who have put Jesus on that cross. The religious leaders hear this and, and, and they're offended, but they're also a little amazed. You know, they, they wonder and they, they see Peter and John. It says in verse 13, they recognize that they had been with Jesus, that they were his disciples. They were his followers. You see, something changed for Peter and John. After Pentecost, they, they come back and, and suddenly they're speaking with power and authority because all of a sudden they realize that their identity was bound up with Christ. All of who they were was defined by Jesus, not by what anybody else said. 
And so they can speak freely and boldly to these crowds, not worrying about what might happen to them. And every time they speak, more and more people come to faith in Christ. And now you might be saying, well, that's all well and good, Vicar, but what does it have to do with me? I'm not Peter, James, or, or John, or, or Paul for that matter. I'm not any of those people. I'm not, I'm not an apostle of Christ. How can I speak like that? How can I do anything like what Peter's doing here? Well, I ask you, what, what is it that gives Peter's sermon weight? What is it that makes it hit home so hard? Why do people listen to what he has to say? Is it because he's, he is smarter than anybody else, because he's more righteous and, and holier and has, has, all, has a special power or has been educated? Well, no, that, that can't be it. In, in verse 13, it says that the religious leaders perceived that Peter and John were common, ordinary, everyday, uneducated men. So what is it? It's that everybody had heard what Peter had done two months earlier. You see, he'd been in the courtyard as Jesus was on trial, and he denied Christ. His failure was epic. It was the thing of legend. It was the thing that you whisper about to all your friends. It's the, it was the, the hot gossip in Jerusalem. Everybody knew what Peter had done. Everybody had heard. And so when Peter starts coming back and, and he's preaching about sin and grace, about failure and forgiveness, people listen. People would hear his message. Because just two months earlier, he cowered before the questioning of a powerless servant girl. I never knew the man. I never knew the man. I don't know who that Jesus is. Peter had denied him before somebody who had no authority over him. And yet here he stands now before the Jewish leaders who have power, bold and courageous, unwavering and proclaiming that message. And as he preaches that law part of the sermon and says, you killed Jesus, everybody knew that he was including himself in that group of you. I, I put him on that cross. And so as he starts to speak of the freeing grace, of the mercy and the forgiveness that, God's, that God offers to, to people just like you and me, to, to the worst of the worst, to the people who have denied Christ, to the people who have turned their back, it comes with street cred. People know that he has learned his lesson in the furnace of failure. That's where he's learned his theology. That's what makes Peter such a great witness, is that he's preaching out of his own experience, his own failure, his own weakness. You know, Martin Luther once said that, that failure and suffering have made me a greater theologian than any book I have ever read. And suffering and failure will make you a better and more down-to-earth theologian than anything else in life. You know, we, we're all theologians. We all have thoughts about God and, and ways we talk about God. But as, as another wise person once said, failure is the front door to grace, and grace is the only room without chains. Let me repeat that. Failure is the front door to grace. And grace is the only room without chains. It's the only place where sin and guilt and shame and insecurity and all those burdens of trying to prove yourself and save yourself fall off. Where you have freedom. But the fact is that, that you can never experience grace at a truly deep level until you've experienced failure at a deep level. And, and don't get me wrong here. I'm not telling you you need to go out and fail epically or you need to, to go out and sin more. The fact is we fail all the time. We sin all the time. We just need to be more honest about it. We need to admit to our failures. When we confess our brokenness, when we confess our struggles, when we confess that we fall short, especially to people outside the church, we don't hear them turn around and say, oh, look at those hypocrites. What you hear them say is, me too, man. I, I know what you're going through. I've been, I've been right there. I'm struggling too. Sometimes as Christians, we think that, that what's going to get people to confess and repent is more law, to put more burden on them, make them realize how bad they are. And so we, we press and press and press and press down on them. But the reality is that the message that sends is that I'm strong and you're weak and you need to get where I am. It tells them that church is a place for good people who want to get better. When in reality, the church is a place for the broken, the lost, the people who just can't pick themselves up, the people who can't get it together, the people who are train wrecks just like me and just like you. The gospel, the good news, is that Jesus has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's our hope. And that's, that's the message we need to hear. And that's the message we need to share with other people. That's the witness that we have to offer. You know, as, as we look at Peter's life, you see that... that he was transformed 
You know, he, he started out in the Gospels and he's this hot shot know-it-all. I'll never deny you, Christ. I'll never leave you. I'll follow wherever you go. I'm going to be the greatest. I'm going to, there, there's nothing that'll separate me from you. But here in Acts, the short time after those stories, we meet a different Peter. He's humble. He's weak. He's not trying to prove it himself. In, in chapter 3 of Acts, he says it. Why are you surprised at this? I'm not doing any of this. It's God. It's Jesus that's doing this through me. You see, that's, that's the message we need to hear. We need to realize that, that God works through broken and sinful people. Peter, Peter has this, this message, and, and he's been changed. And once he goes through that, he, he can't be the same person. And, and he, he's weak, and he realizes that, that God only works through his weakness. And it, and it makes it easier for God to work through his brokenness and his weakness. That you don't need to be clean to be used by God. You see, that's another problem that sometimes we hear in the church that, that God, we think that God can or will only use clean people as if clean people exist, you know, or, or at least the cleaner and more pious people. So if he's using me, well, I must be doing pretty good, you know. I must, I must have, have taken care of my stuff because, I'm, I mean, that must mean I'm just, everyone knows I'm not a sinner like those people. I'm not like them. I'm not as bad as the, the prostitutes. I'm not as bad as the, the pedophiles. I'm not as bad as the, the homosexuals. I'm not as bad as, as Hitler or Mussolini. But the fact is, in our thoughts, we are just as bad. We're just as broken, just as sinful. As Paul puts it in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He doesn't say all have sinned and some far, fall far shorter of the glory of God. But all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and in James, in his epistle, he writes that if you've broken one commandment, you have broken them all. The reality is that, that God only uses broken, sinful, dirty, no good people because that's the only kind of people there are. That's all of us. I mean, the truth is that, that some of us just hide that reality better than others. We're better at concealing it and putting up a facade that says we're cleaner or better than somebody else. But that's not the reality. You know, as, it's, it's amazing as you look at the, the way that the church grows in Acts. Because after the ascension of Jesus, the first preacher, the first preacher is Peter. A man who, whose failure was legendary, whose denial was epic. Everybody had heard about it. We read about it in Matthew. You know, Jesus, Peter denies Christ, and then Jesus looks at him. Peter remembers what Jesus said, and he weeps. He's broken up by this. He knows he's failed. And so as he goes out there with John and, and he begins to preach the gospel, the, the religious leaders look at them and say, how dare you talk to us about grace? How dare you talk to us about God? Who, who do you think you are? We know your denial. We know you're not clean. We know you don't pray right. We, don't, we know you don't fast. We remember how Jesus didn't fast right. Don't you remember how we questioned you? How dare you speak to us? You know, that's, that's the message that Peter gets. And sometimes that's what Christians tend to think about other people. We think we put ourselves on a different level. But the reality is we're all, we're all broken sinners in need of grace. And, and it's interesting as you, as you go through this and you just hear these things change. And you see Peter and John have been changed. So how, how have they been changed? Well, <clears throat> Peter just lets all that criticism shrug off his shoulders. Because after Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit came on him, he hears the same three-word sermon the Holy Spirit always preaches. It is finished. 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 Christ has won it for you. He's done it all. There's nothing more you need to prove. There's no more you need to pay. He's already paid the full price for your redemption. So come hell or high water, you are saved. You are his son or you are his daughter. Peter has heard that message. And it drives out all shame, all guilt, all judgment that he feels. See, Peter no longer is afraid. He no longer lives in fear because he's experienced Christ's perfect love. And Christ's perfect love casts out all fear. So we don't experience that anymore. The problem we have as Christians is that sometimes in those dark moments, we wonder, is my sin really covered? Does Jesus really love me? Even after I've done that, even after I've done something as terrible as this, th does God still have my back? We sit there and we wonder. And, and we hear the good news of the gospel and we think, well, that's just way too good to be true after what I've done. And it's in moments like that that we need to look to Peter, 
who, who has failed epically and yet has been restored and redeemed by God. And, and now he speaks boldly because he knows there is redemption. He knows there is redemption for anyone as bad as him. And he, he knows that he's the worst sinner of them all. He, he could utter the same words as Paul, that I'm the chief of sinners. Paul, Peter could say the exact same words about himself. And so as, as Peter does this, it's just amazing. It's, he goes out and he preaches this amazing sermon. But you need to also realize something. See, Peter's failed before, but he'll fail again after this, time and time again. We hear about one of those failures in Galatians when Paul says that he had to rebuke Peter when he denied Christ by refusing to eat with the Gentiles. Peter fails again and again. And as Christians in our lives, in our, in our walk with God, we're going to fail again and again. Sometimes we think that that the Christian walk is kind of like the arrow on the left. We just, we constantly get better. But it's a little more like the, the arrow on the right. Sometimes we take 10 steps back and one step forward. Sometimes we take two steps back and then four steps back and then five steps back and then a step forward. You know, we, we live these lives where, where failure is just a reality. We live in this broken world where we're still sinners and saints at the same time. And, and you know, even if you've been a Christian for 15, 30, or 60 years, you need to realize that your worst failure might be ahead of you tomorrow. It, it's possible. And, and that even then, the gospel is still true for you. Even then, you are still forgiven. If, if your understanding of God, if your understanding of grace can't handle the truth that, that you might not be getting better tomorrow, then you need to scrap your understanding of God because we have a God who is all about forgiveness all about forgiving our faults and our failures, whose mercies are new every day. Every morning, God's mercy is new for sinners just like you and me. Because we realize that, that God knows that while we're a new creation, while we've been given a new heart, we still struggle in this broken and fallen world. And responding with more law and more demands doesn't change who we are. The way we're changed, the way we're shaped into new people is by being given a new heart. And we get a new heart when we realize that we have been forgiven free of cost to ourselves and at the immeasurable cost that Christ paid on the cross. That's what changes us. You see, the, the remedy we're offered when we fail, the remedy we're offered and the, the greatest witness we get to give is the very words of the Holy Spirit that it is finished, that you are forgiven, you are free no matter what comes tomorrow. As it says in, in the epistle lesson from today, 1 John chapter 3, you know, the, our hearts want to condemn us. They tell us, you've fallen short. They tell us, you haven't done enough. They tell us, you're no good. But God's word of love overshadows that command. And it says, you are my child. You are forgiven. You are loved. You belong to me. Even if you fail and fail again, you are still mine. The reality is that, that people outside the church, they don't need our strength or our power or our piety. What they need is Christ. They need Jesus' power, his strength, his perfection for them. That's the message we have to offer. We can offer our weakness, our brokenness. We can put on display God's power at work in the powerless. That's who we are. We realize that spiritually we're powerless. It's only on account of God that we have been saved and we have been given grace. And so that's the message that we get to proclaim. That's the good news. That's the witness, the greatest witness we get to share. That I'm a sinner, I'm broken, I'm a train wreck, I couldn't save myself no matter how hard I tried. I can't do any, I can barely do anything right. But even for people like me, God offers his grace, his salvation, his forgiveness, his mercy in Christ. And he offers the same thing to you. That's the message we get to share. That Christ is our hope and God welcomes home even the worst sinners with open arms. And I know that, that going out and, and sharing your weakness, sharing your brokenness is a terrifying thing. And so I want to leave you with the words of Joshua 1 verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. For the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go and whatever may come. God is with you. His strength is all you need. His power is all you need. And so may that strength, may that mercy, may that power keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.